This video is supported by CuriosityStream. Hey, is that your car? Oh, yeah. Tesla, right? Yeah, it's a uh, Model 3. Totally electric, no fossil fuels at all. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, except for the coal burn making the electricity. I'm on an all renewable plant, so. Well, my car has a hydrogen fuel cell, so. Oh. Runs on pure water. Oh, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, except that takes a lot more parts and they have to fly that all around the world. That increases the number of emissions just in the production. Tesla actually does most of their stuff in the US to avoid that. Well, my car is made from carbon fiber, spun from the carbon dioxide in the air. <laughs> all right, well, my car uh, makes ozone and it's, it's fixing the hole in the ozone layer. Well, my car separates hydrogen and oxygen using the pure joy of corgi puppies. Well, my car plants a tree in the rainforest for every mile that I drive. Well, my car is biodegradable and will feed a thousand birds when I'm done with it. Are you turned on right now? Uh, what? What? Did you just... I, did that, you just... No, that wasn't... <laughs> Are you turned on right now? I didn't say I was turned on. I just asked if you were. No, no, you were are sexually aroused, right? You disgusting pervert! I'm not a pervert. You, you were talking green stuff. I like green stuff. I got a green on. Green on? Yeah. 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 I like the environment so much, I want to have sex with it. Ha! Something is wrong with you. Come on, Zoe. Come on, Zoe. Something went wrong there. In September of this last year, I became an EV owner and I made a promise to myself. I promised that I wouldn't become one of these EV douchebags that's just like constantly talking about how awesome EVs are. I've failed at that. Now in my defense, battery electric vehicles are the hot thing right now. As I've talked in previous videos, in the next few years, almost every single car maker has some kind of EV on the way. But there is one glaring exception, Toyota. Toyota, who pioneered hybrid cars with the Prius, who made driving green cool, that had the first real electric drivetrain in a popular car. They have no EVs on the market and none in their pipeline, outside of an electric version of the RAV4, which is really just a compliance car. Why would Toyota, of all companies, that has such a stellar record on eco-friendly vehicles not be on the EV train? It's because they're placing their bets on a different kind of zero emission technology, hydrogen fuel cells. So let's take a look at hydrogen fuel cells and see if Toyota knows something that we don't. HFCs, as they're often called, have a long and interesting history. Sir William Robert Grove of Wales was credited with inventing the first version of what we now call a hydrogen fuel cell back in 1838. The idea behind fuel cells is it's basically a tiny power plant that uses hydrogen to make electricity. It works by taking an anode and a cathode and sandwiching between them what they call a proton exchange membrane, or PEM. Hydrogen is flowed into the anode, which separates the electrons and protons. The proton exchange membrane lets the protons through, but not the electrons. The electrons have to reroute around the membrane to get to the cathode, which creates an electric current. This current is then stored in the batteries and used to run the electric motor. Once the electrons have done their thing, they flow back through the cathode where it reconnects with the protons forming H2, which is then mixed with the outside air, combines with oxygen, and creates water vapor, which is what comes out of the exhaust. And the outside air has to be super clean, so the intakes are heavily filtered, which means that you're basically cleaning the air as you drive. Now because the car is constantly replenishing the energy in the batteries with electricity from the fuel cell, it doesn't need very big batteries at all. Fewer batteries means less weight, less weight means less power needed to make it go, and more range. Fuel cells were first used to power a vehicle in 1959 with a 20 horsepower tractor, but they've really gained traction in uh, the Apollo and Gemini programs with NASA. Since rockets use hydrogen and oxygen as fuel anyway, they decided to just kind of put those into a fuel cell and create electricity for the capsule that way. And in the space shuttle, they actually captured the exhaust uh, H2O as water, and the astronauts drank that for water. So in some ways, fuel cells are kind of a NASA spin-off technology. Now about the time that fuel cells were starting to prove themselves in space, scientists were starting to realize the dangers of all the fossil fuel emissions that were going into the atmosphere, plus there was the big oil embargo that was going on, so there was a big push to find new, cleaner ways of getting around. Now batteries at the time weren't quite ready for prime time. The energy density wasn't high enough to get people the kind of range that they wanted, so a lot of people were looking at fuel cells, which were working really great in the space program, 
as the you know driver of the future and people started to imagine that hydrogen might be the new gasoline in fact chemistry professor john bacher has coined the term hydrogen economy to describe a future where we'd use hfcs to power everything a future he and a team of scientists worked to promote throughout the 70s 80s and 90s and one of the major reasons this didn't happen is because the platinum that's required for the anode in a fuel cell is prohibitively expensive but this changed in the 2000s when new anode materials actually dropped the price down to a fifth of previous levels but also around that time, battery technology hit some major breakthroughs in energy density due to the scaling and development of lithium ion technology. So that kind of evened the playing field. So when you consider these two options on a mass scale, the first thing you have to consider is efficiency, which is another way of saying how much energy you have to put in to make the car go forward. Both cars run on electric motors, which are incredibly efficient, roughly 96% efficient at taking energy and converting it into motion. So you're only losing about 4% there. Both cars store their energy in batteries that have to convert energy to AC current which means it has to pass through an inverter, which can operate at 90 to 98% efficiency. For our purposes, we can split the difference, call it 94%, meaning a 6% loss. Additionally, batteries have charging inefficiencies, which apply to both vehicles as well. EVs charge from the grid, whereas fuel cells charge from the fuel cells. Using Tesla's estimated charging efficiency of 92%, we can calculate another 8% loss. And for battery electrics, that's pretty much it. If you want to account for phantom drain, you can add another 2% loss, but even that might be steep. So in terms of operation, EVs are roughly 80% efficient. But fuel cell cars add another step, the step of converting hydrogen gas to electricity. And at our current fuel cell technology, this is only 60% efficient, resulting in an additional 40% loss. Add that loss to the engine inverter and charger losses, and you're operating at about 42% efficiency. Now that's just talking about the operation of the vehicles, but to get a much better picture, you have to look at the whole life cycle of the fuel. And here's where things get a lot more stark. Because hydrogen gas, despite being the most abundant element in the universe, is actually not naturally found on Earth. Like helium, it's light, so it just floats up to the very top of the atmosphere where you can't get to it. But unlike helium, hydrogen is a building block of many compounds and molecules, which you can strip out of those compounds and molecules and get hydrogen that way. Most industrial hydrogen these days is created from a process called steam methane reforming, and this is super efficient at creating hydrogen, the only problem is it does create CO2 in the process, so it's far from clean, which kind of defeats the whole point. So let's not do that. The other way to get hydrogen is through electrolysis, and this is pretty simple. You zap water with an electric current, and that separates out the hydrogen and the oxygen. The only problem is it takes a massive amount of electricity, far more energy going into it than you ever get out. So it's not a net positive. In fact, you lose about 30% from electrolysis, but there are some newer methods out there using that same protein exchange membrane that I talked about before. It's almost like a, a fuel cell in reverse. And this is a little bit more efficient. You only lose 20% in this process. Now there is another loss point, that is compression. Hydrogen gas has to be compressed in order to be used, usually to around 780 atmospheres, and this takes energy, removing about 13% of the efficiency. And last but not least, hydrogen has to be transported to the filling station where it's actually going to be pumped into the cars. Realistically, this is going to be done on the back of diesel semi-trucks, which again, kind of defeats the purpose. But let's just say we are in a full hydrogen economy and these are being transported on semis that are running off of fuel cells themselves. I did a little bit of back of the envelope math using specs from Toyota's um, portal experimental fuel cell truck. The truck uses about 0.2 kilograms of hydrogen per mile and I estimated an average of 400 miles to drive to the furthest endpoint from the refinery. Then I factored in how many liters of liquid hydrogen it would carry, timed its energy density, and calculated the percentage of that amount that it was spent by driving and came up with a whopping 2.3%. So when you add these losses into the picture, 20% from electrolysis, 13% from compression, and an extra 2%, I'll round down for simplicity, you've lost 35% before the fuel even gets in the car. That remaining 65% is then used to run the car at 42% efficiency, resulting in an overall efficiency of 27.3%. And this is the best case scenario. Comparatively, the electricity that goes into a battery electric car requires no electrolysis, no compression, and no transportation. It just travels over the grid to your home or charging station, where it loses about 5% along the way meaning soup to nuts, battery EVs operate at about 75% efficiency. Now, before you guys jump into the comments and say anything about this, I'm gonna leave out how this electricity is produced in the first place because it's gonna be the same either way, just for the sake of comparison, that you know, the electrolysis for the hydrogen is gonna take a lot of electricity, the batteries for the car are gonna take a lot of electricity, both of those are gonna be coming from the same source, so it kinda washes out in the end. So let's just pretend for now we're living in some idyllic world where it's all green, clean energy, okay? All right, so this looks like a no-brainer. Like, why? Why would Toyota, or anybody for that matter, want to go this route? Because while efficiency matters, what also matters is how this works in practice. And fuel cell cars, in many ways, 
are kind of the best of both worlds. You can fill the tank in less than five minutes just like a gas car instead of having to sit there for 20 minutes to an hour with an electric car. But they run on electric motors, which gives you that instant torque that EV drivers love so much. But they also don't have thousands of pounds of batteries weighing them down, giving them a lighter weight and a longer range. But they produce no carbon emissions and actually clean the air as you drive. So the real comparison here might not be hydrogen versus electric, it's hydrogen versus gas. And this is illuminating. Using the same metrics we were using before, let's follow the efficiencies evolved in gasoline cars. First, you have to drill the oil out of the ground, which takes energy and more energy all the time because the easy oil went bye-bye years ago. Then you burn energy to transport the oil to the refinery. Then you burn energy to refine the oil into gasoline. Then you have to transport that gasoline to filling stations in the back of trucks, and this takes more energy. And then while the gas is sitting at the gas station, there's actually an evaporation rate. So by the time the gas gets in your car, already 42% of the energy in each gallon of gas has been expended just getting it there. And then on top of all of that, the average internal combustion engine only turns 23% of that energy into motion, meaning for every gallon of gas, only around 15% does anything whatsoever. The other 85% is completely wasted. Oh, and every step of this process creates more carbon emissions. This is the efficiency that 99% of us get when we drive every single day, which means two things. One, clearly hydrogen is better than gasoline. And two, clearly we don't care about efficiency. We care about experience. All this about efficiency and energy density and life cycle, the blah, 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 that's so far outside of our thought process. All we care about is something that's simple to put into our cars, that's cheap, and that gets us as far as possible. That's it. And that brings me to infrastructure. Our gasoline infrastructure is massive and ubiquitous and just a huge part of our lives already. It's a done deal. But this is where EVs and hydrogen still have a long way to go. I made the argument in the past that the EV infrastructure is already 90% there because technically any place there's an outlet is a place you can charge your car. And granted, charging from a 110 outlet is extremely slow, but your car spends 90% of the time parked. It can just be charging during all that time. I actually did that myself when I first got my EV. It's longer traveling and road trips that are the issues with EVs, and yes, the EV infrastructure is still in the early days of being built out with only 25,000 charging stations around the US right now. Now hydrogen by comparison is a lot more like gas. It's not something you can do at home. You gotta go to a hydrogen filling station, of which in the United States right now there are 39, 21 of which are in Los Angeles. <laughs> okay, so that's bad, but let's just say that we got serious about hydrogen for a second. I think the same argument that I make about electrics applies to hydrogen as well, the argument being that 90% of the infrastructure is already there. There are roughly 150,000 gas stations in the United States right now, each of them being fed fuel through a network of pipelines and trucks, and each of them could be modified partially anyway to deliver hydrogen. So proponents of hydrogen fuel cells see this as something that can kind of piggyback on gasoline and maybe eventually replace it. But it does actually get better than that because hydrogen is one thing over gasoline. And that is, hydrogen can be made anywhere. Electrolysis is not something that has to be done at some big massive plant. If you've got water and you've got electricity, you can make hydrogen. You can make it right there at the filling station. And if the little mini plant at the filling station is run by solar panels, well, now we're getting somewhere. And this is the hydrogen future that fuel cell proponents believe in. Literally hundreds of thousands of cars on the road getting fantastic performance, great range, being fueled by locally produced hydrogen, powered by renewable energy, literally cleaning the air as they go. It's easy to see why they believe in this future so much. And it is definitely a compelling future. But is it a future we'll ever actually see? Right now there are only three fuel cell cars in the market. The Honda Clarity with a range of 366 miles, the Toyota Mirai with 312 miles of range, and the Hyundai Nexo with up to 500 miles of range. Now these are roughly in line with the prices and the ranges of current uh, battery electrics that are on the road. The one difference is hydrogen fuel right now is really expensive. It's like $14 per kilogram. The average car takes about 80 bucks to fill up. Now obviously these prices will go down over time with scale, but with battery electrics already getting such a head start, Will fuel cells ever catch up? Is there a Tesla out there for fuel cells on the horizon? That being a, a car that excites people's imagination and really shows how great the technology is? Or could hydrogen cars actually benefit from the growth of EVs as people get used to the idea of cars that aren't driven by gas? In five years, you should expect to see at least 10 times the number of EVs on the road. And even conservative estimates say that one third of cars will be battery electric by the year 2040. And fuel cell cars, which are a type of EV, could ride this wave. Of course, the infrastructure would need to be you know, built up. Nobody's gonna buy a car if they can't fuel it. But all it takes is for one gasoline company to really get behind it and start outfitting all of their stations with hydrogen. That and for the price to come down. Now both of these technologies are improving and getting cheaper every single year. Batteries have the upper hand right now, but this isn't a race. It's not a zero sum game. You might think electrics are the way to go, but hydrogen is still way better than gas. And if I may 
opine for just a second, I actually think that hydrogen might be more easily accessible for most people. Uh, hear me out. You know, one thing I've found especially hard to get across to people when I talk about my, uh, you know, driving an EV is the idea of me just charging at home. You know, the idea that I don't have to, like, go somewhere to charge up my car. I can just do it in my garage. That just blows people's minds. And I think it's because all of us, our entire lives, have had to actually go somewhere with our car to fill them up. That's just a fundamental part of owning a car. That's just a part of our life routine. But EVs require something of a, a shift in thinking. You almost have to think of it more like a phone. It's just something you plug in when it gets low. You know, most of the time you charge your phone at home or at work or wherever you happen to be. Sometimes when you're traveling, you might have to use one of those little charging stations in the airport or something like that. But most of the time, it's just where you are. That's what owning an EV is like. And this really is what seems to trip people up the most whenever I talk to them about EVs. It's not so much a habit thing, it's just more like having to kind of rethink what a car is kind of thing. You know, to a lot of people, a car is a thing you have to take someplace and put fuel into it to make it go. And it might be an easier switch for some people to just go down to the corner station and put in hydrogen instead of gas. You know, that might be easier for some people to embrace. But I guess we'll see. You know, a lot of people are dismissive of fuel cell technology, and I say, you know, we need all the solutions we can get. A day when you go to buy a car and you have the option of getting an electric or a fuel cell, that's a good day indeed. So no more fighting. Now, if that sounds good to you, if you are into visions of a good future, you might want to check out the series Dream the Future on CuriosityStream. It's actually hosted by Sigourney Weaver, and it kind of tries to take a look at what are the technologies that run our lives might look like in the year 2050. There is one specifically about transportation, but it covers all kinds of different topics. Food, energy, school, even heritage. In other words, how they'll look back at us. <laughs> Which sounds terrifying. And this is, of course, just one of thousands of awesome science documentaries and shows available at CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is basically like the Netflix for awesome science documentaries. And I know I probably shouldn't be using the word Netflix when I'm doing a sponsorship for CuriosityStream, but there, I've already said it twice. Who cares? It, that's the best way to say it. It's the Netflix of science documentaries, and it's awesome. Anyway, if you follow my channel, if you follow other science channels, CuriosityStream is totally right up your alley. You can sign up and get one month free at the link down in the description below. I do have a CuriosityStream account. It's kind of one of the perks of being a major YouTube star, but no, I've been watching the hell out of it and I like it a lot. I think you guys will too. So you can sign up down below, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. You can get one month for free. It's definitely worth a look. All right, thanks to CuriosityStream for A, being awesome and B, supporting this video. And I also want to give a big shout out to my answer files on Patreon who have created a wonderful community. I just love all these guys and there's some new people that have just joined. Uh, I got to murder their names real quick. We got Jason Daniel Smith, Stephen Neville, Gary Stevens, Sean Cook, Sarong Sahabadabood, <laughs> yeah, uh, Joseph Gaines, Ian Lake, uh, Cran Middlecoat, Dan Garvin, Cody Tatro, uh, Michael Sepanek, Richard A. Furman, Owen Dana Rollins, Robag, Arn Fines, Net Yellow, Emily Burnt, uh, Hank Voltheus, Alex Lees, Nathan Campbell, Subatomic, and Jupiter Mining. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to early uh, versions of the videos and get behind the scenes stuff and just get access to me, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. I also want to give a big shout out to Brandy Price. She helped me out with the intro at the beginning of this video and I think she nailed it. She's awesome. She's an actor. You probably saw her in something before now, but she also does have a YouTube channel. I'll put a link right here. I recommend you go check it out. She's awesome. T-shirts is always available in the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Lots of cool, fun, nerdy, geeky stuff. I like them, I wear them, I think you will too, uh, answersjoe.com slash shirts. Go get one. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.